Thank you all very much. I know a few people are still trickling in, but we're going to go ahead and get started so we can keep everything moving on time. Um, good morning again, and welcome to the White House. Uh, and of course, we are all here to uh, remark um, <clears throat> or note the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, without this uh, transformative piece of legislation, I know that I would not be standing on this stage in front of you today. Um, we are also here to celebrate nine champions of change for disability advocacy across generations. And to kick off our celebration, I'd like to introduce Senior Advisor Valerie Jarrett. <laughs> Valerie is a champion for Opportunity for All, and I'm very proud to call her my boss. Yeah. Oh, that was really sweet. Thank you, Maria. Good morning, everyone. We are so excited to have you here. It has been quite a week uh, with our celebrations. The president had a terrific reception last week, and we had a cross-section of people uh, from across the country who came to help celebrate, and he charged them with doing more. Just last night, Maria and I were at the Kennedy Center, where we had a celebration uh, with Senator Harkin, who I know many of you know, penned the bill. We gave shout-outs to Congressman Hoyer. Uh, we honor Jean Kennedy Smith and all of the work that she has done. And um, so we've had really a week of celebrations. But I have to tell you, one of the best events that we do here are Champions of Change. And the reason why is because it gives us a chance to put the spotlight on ordinary people across our country who are doing just absolutely extraordinary things and, be, and really provide inspiration and beacons of hope and there's no better flattery than invitation. So our hope is that for the nine of you, there are going to be 9,000 and then 900,000 and 9 million who will follow in your footsteps and, uh, and get a bit of that energy and chemistry from you to feel this sense of responsibility to give back to the community. So before my remarks go any further, I want to take a chance to highlight each of our champions and, um, and be recognized. And they are an extraordinary, as we like to say, uh, intergenerational group. So to begin with, there is Dil Shad Ali. Dil, hands up. Dil is an advocate with the Virginia Autism Project. She helped facilitate the passage of landmark autism insurance legislation. And she's also worked with Enable Muslim and Mushin, the first ever disability advocacy organization focusing on creating uh, programs of inclusion, mentoring, and resource sharing in the American Muslim community. So congratulations to you. Round of applause. <laughs> Next, we have Mike Ellis. Mike is the national director of Sprint Relay where he works to create innovative solutions that increase communication and information access for people who are hearing impaired. Mike? Where's Mike? There you are. All right. There's Mike. <laughs> Next, Sandy Ho. Sandy is a disability youth advocate, and she's been key in developing the Easter Seals Thriving Mentoring Program for young women with disabilities and founded Th Letters to Thrive, an international project where disabled women around the world share life experiences through letters to their younger selves. Sandy. <laughs> we also have Catherine Hutchinson. Catherine had a brain stem stroke at the age of 43 and the stroke left her quadriplegic and nonverbal. Kathy was institutionalized and shared her experience while serving as a named plaintiff in the class action Hutchins versus Park. As a result of her efforts, a statewide settlement agreement secured access to home and community-based services for hundreds of other Massachusetts residents with acquired brain injury. We're so delighted to honor you, Catherine. Next, we have 
Talila, uh, Talila A. Lewis. Talila is an activist and an attorney whose research is focused on creating equal access to the legal system for individuals who are deaf and who are deaf and people with disabilities. Talia advocates with and for hundreds of deaf defendants, prisoners, and returned citizens, and trains justice, legal, and correctional professionals about the varied disability-related concerns. Please join me in recognizing her. Next, we have Brian Mirma, who is a sophomore at Cornell University, where he started an assistive technology blog to help others with disabilities learn about available resources. Please join me in recognizing Brian. Also, we have Maxwell Barrows, who is a young man with autism who works for the Green Mountain Cell Advocates. It's a disability rights organization in Vermont. And as the outreach director, he mentors youth and adults with developmental disabilities to speak up for themselves and become leaders. Please join me in recognizing Maxwell. <laughs> Next, we have Dior Vargas, a mental health activist. She is a crisis text line crisis counselor. That's a mouthful. A crisis text line crisis counselor and a facilitator for the Young Adult Support Group, a National Alliance on Mental Illness, NYC Metro. Please join me in recognizing Dior. Please, everybody, as a group, is this an extraordinary group of champions who change our world? So as I hope you know, since first taking office, President Obama has worked very hard to deliver on behalf of the community of people with disabilities and to increase opportunity for all Americans. He believes we should all be defined by our abilities and not defined by our disabilities. On February 12th, the President signed an executive order to raise the minimum wage for workers on a new and replacement federal contracts to up to 10 $10.10 for everyone. Under current law, workers whose productivity is affected because of their disability may be paid less, wage, less in wages and than others for doing the exact same job, and he thought that was not right and not fair, and so he changed it. Under the new executive order, all people working under service, construction, and concession contracts with the federal government will make at least a minimum of $10.10. That's good news. We are also very proud that the President wants to lead by example in the employment arena. And there are more people with disabilities working in the federal government now than any time in the last 32 years. Our work is not done, and we will continue that effort until the last day we are here. We believe that diversity is a strength. Our country, our country and our federal government should reflect the diversity, richness of diversity of our population. And we have made a very intentional, conscious effort of making sure to recruit people with disabilities in the administration. The President also believes that all people deserve affordable health care. Hopefully that doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. <laughs> We're really pr rather proud of Obamacare. We're delighted that it's called Obamacare, because he does care. We are particularly pleased that insurance companies can no longer discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions or impose annual or lifetime caps just when you need it most. Historically, insurance was not available. And now for every single American, having been tested not once, but twice at the Supreme Court, Affordable Care is here to stay. And so I guess in closing, I want to say to you that uh, as we reflect upon the President's approach, his philosophy since the day he's been in office, in fact, since the day he started as a community organizer on the south side of Chicago, is to make sure that every voice is heard in our country, even the softest voices, to speak for those without voice, who
who have historically been left behind. And he wants to make sure that every person gets that fair shot, regardless of zip code, regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, and regardless of your ability or disability. If you're prepared to work hard in our country, you should get that fair shot. That reflects his values. He, be he believes it reflects the values of our country. It's what makes us strong. It's what makes us competitive. It's what makes us great. And it's what makes us decent and good, too. And those are all important. And sometimes in this town, the decent and good gets left by the side, which is why we're so glad to have all of you. You're a constant reminder of why we work so hard, on whose behalf we're fighting. You keep our focus as it should be on the long haul. And your work just makes us so proud of each and every one of you. So to the champions, I say congratulations. To those of you who are here supporting the champions, they couldn't be champions without you. To those of us who are watching our live stream, which we enjoy broadcasting across the country, who couldn't be here, I hope in your hometowns you will celebrate these champions by finding your own champions and hold them up as we hold up the folks who are here with us today. So thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it back over to Maria. Thank you so much for those words, Valerie. I'd now like to introduce Cecilia Munoz. Cecilia is the head of our Domestic Policy Council. Many of the achievements that Valerie mentioned in her remarks would not have been possible without Cecilia's leadership. So Cecilia, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to start by echoing um, Valerie's warm welcome to you all. We're really, really excited to have you here. This is an important day. This is a hugely important milestone. And we also know that we have hugely important work still ahead of us. So it's, it's good to take a moment to step back and reflect on how far we've come uh, and to use that as motivation for the work ahead. Um, so congratulations to our Champs of Change. And thank you so much um, for your inspiration and for all of your hard work. Um, when uh, President Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law, he said, with today's signing of the landmark Americans with Disability Act, every man, woman, and child with a disability will pass through once closed doors into a bright new era of equality, independence, and freedom. And I know that some of you today um, were there on the South Lawn on July 26, 1990. Um, it was one of the largest bill signings the White House ever hosted. Um, so 25 years um, is an important milestone. Um, and it, so it's important to celebrate the 25th anniversary of this transformative law. It's resulted in greater civil rights for 56 million Americans living with disabilities today. And this victory was the result of a lot of hard work by a lot of courageous people um, to make sure that, as the President likes to say, we continue on our path to becoming a more perfect union, um, that we make sure that the American dream is accessible to all. So President Bush's comments were impassioned, they were eloquent, and some of the most powerful voices in the continued struggle for disability rights come from the people who are most affected by the structural barriers that people with disabilities face. That's why we're here today. And that's why we celebrate Champions of Change. You are unique um, because we are honoring individuals across generations, some of whom have been advocating for disability rights for decades, and others who are the next generation of leadership who are going to carry on this struggle for decades to come. Every day, people with disabilities make tremendous contributions to our country. And one of the ways in which our champions of change today contribute to the country is by moving the needle on access, equity, and inclusion beyond just the space of compliance. Um, these champions are the embodiment of something that Justin Dart, who is the father of the ADA, said, the ADA is only the beginning. It's not a solution. Rather, it's an essential foundation on which solutions will be constructed. In other words, the ADA is a baseline. It tells us what we should be aspiring to, but simple protection under the law isn't sufficient unless we make accessibility real to all people uh, all across the country. So the law is an important foundation. It's a statement of our values. It's the construct on which we build, but the building is tremendously, tremendously important. And this president is really determined to make sure that we are inclusive of people with disabilities as part of his larger vis vision 
of making sure that we really realize the dream in this country, that the, this notion of no matter who you are, um, uh, you, you have a chance to get ahead if you're willing to work hard. So that includes things like the President's commitment to things like family leave or closing the pay gap for women to creating common sense immigration reform. This idea is that we as a country, as a people, are committed to opportunity for every single American. And that includes Americans with disabilities. Providing greater opportunity for Americans with disabilities is inextricably linked to each individual's success, but it's also linked to the success of our local communities and to our nation as a whole. And to be honest about it, if we're really being truthful, we are leaving tremendous talent on the table in the United States today. Only 62% of students with disabilities graduate from high school on time. And when workforce participation rates among people with disabilities remain at 20%, and even when those Americans with disabilities who are working full time continue to experience persistent wage gaps, it's clear that we're leaving talent on the table and that we need to do more to address the structural and attitudinal barriers that hinder not only the success of Americans with disabilities, but the success of the nation as a whole. This administration is working really hard to address those barriers. That's part of why we're here today. This is a celebration, but it's also a moment to uh, help us remember to rededicate ourselves to the work ahead. So a major barrier for students with disabilities receiving high quality education, particularly post-secondary education, are entrance exams. These high stakes tests can be nerve wracking for anybody, whether you have a disability or not. But when you add the additional effort it often takes to receive basic testing accommodations, many students feel defeated before they even take their test. The same is true for entrance exams for professional certifica uh, certifications or credentials, sometimes even job applications. So later this month, the Department of Justice is going to release technical assistance to provide guidance on testing accommodations for people with disabilities who take standardized exams and other high stakes tests. That's So the document's going to describe the responsibilities of testing entities that offer exams or courses related to applications, licensing, certification, or credentialing for secondary, post-secondary, professional, or trade purposes. It's an important step forward, and we're proud of the DOJ for putting this forward. Another tangible legacy of the Americans with Disabilities Act is accessible public transit. So when I use a bus, I expect it to kneel down and accommodate my neighbors who use wheelchairs. And yet, even when people can receive high quality education and make it through required exams, too many people with disabilities lose out on employment because they can't access accessible public transit to get them to their jobs. To address this, the Federal Transit Administration will soon announce the Mobility Services for All Americans Deployment Planning Project, which will showcase promising technologies and practices that improve travel planning and coordination for people who need specialized transportation. Valerie mentioned the promising results of the President's executive order on federal hiring of people with disabilities. More people with disabilities in federal service now than in the last 30 years. Let that sink in because it's really great news. And some even better news is that in the coming months, the EEOC intends to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking to amend its regulations implementing Section 501 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which requires the federal government to engage in affirmative action for people with disabilities. So this rule is going to complement new regulations under Section 503 that require federal contractors to take affirmative steps to recruit, hire, promote, and retain workers with disabilities. These increased regulations also require increased data collection and record keeping to, promote, to improve employer accountability. So I work at the Domestic Policy Council. I am a policy wonk by nature. And new proposed rules, the, ex uh, the expansion and the more specificity around Section 503 collecting data, releasing data. These are all very wonky policy kinds of objectives. They are tremendously important because the, the point that we're making within the federal government and for federal contractors is you shouldn't be leaving talent on the table. You should have a plan for recruiting and hiring and retaining and promoting people with disabilities. That's the idea and we're moving forward both with respect to federal hiring but also with respect to federal contractors. Again, because uh, these are, um, important because of the contributions that people have to make and because the more inclusive our workforce is, the more successful we all are. So this is a commitment that the President is making um, and these are, will be part of the President's legacy, again, on making sure that we continue to become a more perfect union. Well, so, applause. thank you very much.
It also gives me pr great pride to say that uh, leaders, um, disability leaders, have contributed to our conversations on community policing, and that the White House recently hosted a meeting to begin to determine how we can better support LGBT youth with mental health needs. The whole conversation on policing is incredibly important, and it needs to include leadership from the disability community if we're going to help local police forces around the country get it right. <laughs> so today is about celebrating and honoring the work of hardworking and inspiring leaders from around the country. Today is also about celebrating and recognizing 25 years of an important milestone in our country's civil rights history. But I really want you to hear from those of us at the White House that today is also very much about the work that is still ahead of us. We are not yet where we need to be. Uh, and, and we know that that's true. We know that that requires work and it requires leadership. And as much as today is about celebrating that kind of leadership which has brought us to this point and which will take us into the future, the, what Champions of Change events does for those of us who work here in the administration is provide inspiration it helps us redouble our commitment to the work ahead. Uh, it gives us hope, um, and I, I suspect we take at least as much, if not more, um, than the, those who are celebrating around the country because we learn so much from all of you. We take so much inspiration from all of you. That's what gives us the energy for the hard work that's still ahead. I have the great honor of working for a president who has worked every day and has energized his team every day around this notion of becoming a more perfect union and around the notion of what it means if we are really opening doors so that everyone can contribute to their fullest potential. It is the thing which makes us great. It is the thing which strengthens us. Those challenges are constantly transforming. We are constantly learning from each other. Um, but that is really what this country is about. And our ability to make sure that all people of all abilities are able to contribute is, is central to who we are and who we will become. So I thank you and congratulate you champions of change for your hard work and for your inspiration. Thank you all very much for the work ahead. Thank you, Cecilia, for your remarks and for your continued leadership. Um, so I'd now like to bring together the first panel of champions to the stage. And as we do that, um, I'd like to shift some people around. So if we could get um, folks who are in the doorway to come up and around to the back of the room, and then anyone else um, who can take a seat. There are a few open seats in the room. So <clears throat> let's get you all in here and comfortable. Um, so for our first panel will be moderated by Judy Human, and will feature Sandy Ho, Dilshad Ali, Dior Vargas, Doug Garner, and Brian Mearsma. I was like, I'm blanking on names, I'm sorry. Um, so you all heard a bit about each of the champions in um, Valerie's opening remarks. I'd like to take a moment to introduce Doug Garner, who is a staff person at the University of Texas Arlington and has dedicated most of his career to inclusive athletics. Go Mavs, he signs all of his emails. <laughs> and Judith Human, many of you probably already know very well, but she is a longtime leader in the disability rights movement and has had many positions and worn many different hats, but currently she is the Special Advisor for International Disability Rights at the U.S. Department of State and the first person to ever hold this position. So Judy and champions, please take it away. Thank you very much. Let me just navigate. Can you pull this? It's very heavy. Good morning, everybody. How many of you are from out of town? And how many of you have been here over the weekend? So wasn't it a great weekend? I think the Smithsonian and the Kennedy Center did a fantastic job. And for those of you who had opportunities to uh, participate in any of the panels, 
that they had over the last three days or to visit the bus or any one of a number of great events. I think it was a great historical opportunity for not just disabled individuals, but for other people who travel into DC or live in DC and just come to the Smithsonian. So I want to thank everyone who put their efforts into that. I also want to thank Valerie Jarrett and Cecilia, um, Eve Hill, who is here, Rebecca Coakley, who did an amazing job last night, Lex Frieden, who is where? Where is Lex? Lex Frieden, who was the uh, chairperson of the National Council on Disability when the ADA was first conceived. <laughs> Mark Johnson, who three years ago really uh, kicked butt and said, if we really want to make this an amazing uh, 25th anniversary, we have to start working early. And he's been an incredible leader on that. So thank you, Mark. <laughs> and then yesterday, there was a great um, interfaith meeting over at one of the uh, religious institutions in DC yesterday, which I thought was really wonderful. and had the opportunity not to face-to-face -face meet, but to hear your comments, um, Dill. So let me say that the way I view the 25th anniversary and the Champions of Change, the Champions of Change are intergenerational, which I think is fantastic, because as a disability rights movement, I think it's important that we not look at those as older and younger, but rather at how we can share experiences and what we need to do to continue to move forward. All of the data that we got from Cecilia and from Valerie, uh, this is data which, while still nowhere near where we want it to be, uh, really is improving from where we were. And everyone in this room and thousands of disabled people, millions of people around the United States, some who voice their concerns, who are active in the community, others who are not actively yet engaged, those are the people that we need to really be harnessing energy. And when we say we have at least 55 million disabled individuals in the world, we need more of those people and their friends and family giving voice not just to the problems, but to the solutions. So the champions of change today, I think, are all individuals who are doing dynamic work in their communities and really are models of what we would like to achieve across the United States. People are asking, what do we ha want to have done in the next 25 years? I really prefer to look at what do we want to have accomplished in the next three to five years. Our benchmark shouldn't be 25 years. Our benchmark should be much closer in so that we really can be measuring outcomes. So I have a series of questions um, that I'd like to start off with. And everyone's been introduced, so I'm not going to do this. By, I'm not going to introduce people. And I'm not going to call on you individually, so I'll put the question forward. And whoever would like to start, please do so. So the first question is, what strategies did you use effectively to advocate around disability in your communities? And I'd also like to add to that, what motivated you to do this? Hello, my name is Sandy. Um, one of the strategies that I used to advocate around disability was mentorship. Um, and what motivated me to do it was really because in my personal life, um, I was the only, or one of the very few representatives of a young women with a disability in my community and in my family. So seeing examples and role models of other uh, disabled women were really important to me um, as a young child and growing up. Um, so I would really say mentorship has been really effective. Um, and also because as an advocate, you know, sometimes we're so busy um, carrying on our objectives and our agendas that it can get very tiring. I'm sure that we've all experienced that. And mentorship is great in that we are able to share that uh, journey and that experience and those responsibilities with others in our community. Um, if we're going to start with what motivates us, I would definitely say the motivation for all this comes from my own son. Uh, I have a near 15-year-old, he'll be 15 in two weeks, uh, son, great kid um, with autism. Uh, 
he has a lot of profound challenges, and he's, I always say he's nonverbal, but he's not non-communicative. He uses an iPad, an assistive communication device to help him communicate to us. But he has a, a lot of challenges in his life, and um, you know, be, being his mom has been what has been the most uh, important thing to me to you know put forth the work that we're doing here now. And it's been twofold. One, it's been you know just in our state of Virginia, and helping pass legislation and helping make things better in our school system and helping be an advocate there. And then it's also been in our Muslim community. And if when we discuss strategies that have been really effective. In our, in our faith community, it's really been about being more public and being more vocal. Just the simple strategy of using your voice and being public and being open about what our challenges are and what our goals are. Um, I found that amongst the faith communities, ours is probably a little bit more behind than what is happening in the Jewish community or the Christian community and other faith communities and what they're doing in disability advocacy. And uh, we've been a little quiet over the years. We've been more behind the scenes. We've been more quiet with our, you know, it, within our community. And, I, and that was just the one thing that I wanted to change. I wanted to be vocal. I wanted to be public. I wanted others to know in our community that there are people with intellectual and physical disabilities and that, you know, they don't need to be staying at home. We all need to be out there in the community, in the world, having access, doing the things we need to do. and. The most effective strategy for me has been just to be as vocal and as public and as open about it as possible in a way that's very respectful to my child as well because I would rather he be the one doing this. But um, since he's not in a position to do it and I am, then that's the, that's the balance that I have to strike. And I'd also like to say that the event that you spoke at yesterday, um, you gave a great presentation. And um, the issue around interfaith um, collaboration is one that's not only important in the United States, but through the State Department, it's one area that we work on when we travel overseas, because in many communities, the faith community is very important and is really a leader within the community. So your work and the work of others, I think, is critically important to really give voice to individuals who have disabilities and to their family members, and to really set an example for what it is that we're trying to change. Thank you. Who'd like to go next? My name is Doug Garner. I'm the Adapted Sports Coordinator at the University of Texas at Arlington. And I guess my job is it's two different things. We have intercollegiate sports for students with disabilities who come to the university, um, growing that from seven athletes seven years ago to over 30 athletes. In, about five different intercollegiate sports. Um, I also help with the Adapted Recreation Program in creating an inclusive and accessible environment for all of our students to have access to uh, recreational opportunities that can help them lead healthier lives and feel more part of the college community. In my time in Adapted Sports, I've served as the commissioner for the National Wheelchair Basketball Association Junior Division and since 1999, trying to grow opportunities for young people, uh, one, because I'll have some athletes in a few years as they grow up, but two, because I've seen what Adapted Athletics has done for my son who was born with spina bifida. And basically, sports is life for a lot of people in the United States, and students with disabilities, young people with disabilities, aren't included in many of those conversations. And having the opportunity to participate in those conversations uh, and to see himself as an athlete, a healthy, fit person who um, has dreams and goals has meant a lot to our family. And that's kind of what motivates me is seeing all these young people. In 1999, there were 33 junior wheelchair basketball programs in the United States. Now we have close to 100 and we're really working hard on getting adapted sports recognized in our public schools so that all students will have the opportunity to be seen as an athlete in their schools, be included in their school environment, in their school sports programs. And one of the things I'm doing now is part of the NCAA Student Athletes with Disabilities Subcommittee where we're working on recognition of collegiate athletes with disabilities at the NCAA level. And uh, that's the big kind of recognition 
point for a lot of people is where well, you're not NCAA. And so NCAA recognizes that through its equity and inclusion subcommittee and uh, is working and moving in that direction. So seeing our athletes in 1989, UTA started offering the first scholarships for athletes with disabilities. The first scholarship re recipient was an end named William Hernandez, and in Texas he was just recognized with the Lex Friedman uh, Award because Willie's senior project as an engineering student was to redesign sport wheelchairs, and he turned that into Performax Wheelchairs, one of the largest wheelchair manufacturing companies in the world, and he hires young people with disabilities who graduate from college to work and help build his company. So seeing these young people graduate, seeing their families, especially the kids, s come and watch them play basketball and be a part of something that's bigger than just being the kid in the wheelchair on the side is something that really, that really motivates me. Uh, and then the last, you mentioned strategies. And I think the big thing that we've done in growing opportunities for young people with physical disabilities is education. Educating people why sports is important in their lives why they need to have a college degree and break the cycle of poverty that many people with disabilities face who don't have access, or they're not motivated to get their degree and move forward and get jobs and represent, uh, be independent and, and reach their fullest potential as a human being. Thank you very much. Who'd like to go next? Seems like we're going in, in <laughs> order. Um, so in terms of my motivation, I live with depression and anxiety, and I decided that I wanted to use my personal lived experience to relate to others and provide a space where things resonate with other people. In terms of uh, strategies, I wanted to use the power of social media. I wanted to use storytelling to help connect different individuals. I wanted also to amplify the voices of marginalized communities, specifically people of color who live with mental illness. And so I decided that I would start a photo project and allow it to be something that was very simple, S simply submitting photos, holding signs, saying that you know I live with mental illness, and allowing them to write whatever they wanted to share whatever they, they felt like sharing. It, it's, I think it's a lot to tell others that you live with a mental illness uh, and so I wanted to allow people to share at their own pace. Uh, everyone is at different stages of their recovery. And so just I think that a lot of advocates are coming from places where they have uh, degrees and credentials that I may not necessarily have, but I have the experience of personal experience. Uh, the, the, that's what I can offer. And I think that, that could, I could relate to others and that they feel that they can trust me with what they're experiencing. And so storytelling, amplifying the voices of others, using social media, photos is something that I think people are always taking and I think that that can be very personal and it could also humanize the experience of mental illness. Thank you. Um, so I, I think a lot of my motivation comes from being a student with dyslexia in school um, as a younger student and struggling um, with reading and not being understood by my teachers. And, but then also seeing how much of a difference um, assistive technology and <coughs> proper um, tutoring and remediation can help. Um, so that was really exciting to me to see how it helped me and then wanting to share that to, with other people um, in similar uh, situations was motivating. Um, and then in terms of strategies, just connecting with other people, whether it's online or face-to-face, has been really important to know that you're not alone out there because sometimes um, in school it could seem like you're the only one that's struggling to read or the only one with a disability, but being open about your disability so you can connect with other people has been a strategy that I found to, to be uh, helpful. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also raise a point with Sandy and Dior. It sounds like the work that you've been doing has some similarities. Maybe, Sandy, you could talk a little bit more about how you've been reaching out. Sure. Um, yeah, so I started the Letters to Thrive project. Um, initially, it was a way to get the young women in the Thrive Mentoring Program to get to know their older disabled women mentors a little bit better. Um, so I asked them to write letters to their younger selves 
and they share it with their mentee and their mentors. Um, and I thought that this was an approach that would be different than just having a conversation because the mentoring programs serve young women between the ages of uh, 14 and 26. And um, you know, when you're a young teenager, sometimes the issues of disability can be very intimidating. Um, you know, some of the issues might be body image, sexuality. They're, they're sort of very private and personal uh, things that we all have thought about. Um, and so sharing it in a letter, um, I thought, presented it in a format that would be more personal. So um, it turns out that this was something that a lot of the mentees and mentors really enjoyed. Um, and with their permission, I posted these letters on a blog, on a Tumblr. And before I knew it, disabled women from across the country and around the world started submitting their letters to their younger selves. Um, and it just sort of spawned into this whole community um, that was not just, you know, it wasn't just about disability-oriented topics, but really sharing narratives, like you were saying, um, and putting our voice back into our own stories. So the photo project was really a response to the invisibility of people of color when it came to the media representation of mental illness. Uh, through my research, uh, just looking through various websites and articles, there were uh, lists of historical figures who lived with depression or other mood disorders, as well as celebrities. And when I looked at those lists, it was overwhelmingly Caucasian individuals. And I think that that's very, it can be very invalidating to others. I think growing up, I felt that I was the only Latina who was living with depression. And I feel that if I had seen that growing up, I would have felt less alone. Uh, and so I wanted to allow people to be in charge of their own media representation. I think that when it comes to individuals of color, uh, we are positioned in a way where we're less, less than human sometimes. And so I feel that when we're in control of our own narrative that we feel more empowered and we, be, we can become uh, better advocates for ourselves and specifically for our mental health care. Are any of you doing work in social media of sorts? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the points that Dior and uh, Sandy are making can't be emphasized enough. Um, the really the whole thing, I mean, the work with the Virginia Autism Project and things like that were things I was always doing. But what pushed me to go public was, was writing, was when I started my own blog. I mean, I'm a journalist by profession and an editor, and I had the tools in front of me all the time, but never felt like I was in a position or willing to share. And there was a certain things we were going through in our life, and I and I just really felt like this is, this we can't be the only ones. You know, we can't. I, I don't hear about Muslims with disabilities. I don't see their faces out there. I don't know where they are, and it's just we just can't be the only ones. You know, and I knew if I felt that way, there had to be thousands just in North America alone who feel the same way. So I started writing. You know. And, uh, and I wrote and I wrote and I promoted on social media and I just shared as much as I could. And it was really hard for the family, I think, because we come from a faith and a culture of being more private. And uh, I just felt that that just wasn't the way we should do this, you know? And um, the response has been phenomenal. You know, the response that comes from people reaching out across the country saying, man, I never knew until you said it, you know? And uh, I. I felt the same way. I thought there was something wrong with me. And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your child. Or if you're the one living with a disability, there's nothing wrong with you, you know? And it's OK to have up days and down days. And it's OK to be public about that. And it's OK to demand that the ones in your life should be you know, helpful and accommodating. And you know, that your mosque should be accommodating. And your community center should be accommodating. And your, you know, your schools should, you know, help you the way you should deserve to be supported because you have worth and you have purpose you know and 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 that's really the point i wanted to make and uh and i can't you know owning your own narrative and the social media aspect of it has been one of or has been the biggest way to get this point across i think mm -hmm. thank you do anybody else here want to talk about social media or how you're getting your messages yeah brian um i guess i can kind of echo what the other panelists have been saying about how empowering um Getting, gaining connections over social media can be because um, it's, it can be easy to think that you're the only one with the disability in your community but being able to con connect with people from far away on social media can be 
really empowering because it's um, it's difficult to go in and advocate for yourself or for um, other people when you're when you think you're alone. But having those connections um, is is really helpful. Thank you. I think what what we do on social media is uh, tell the stories that educate others, and for for our program, we put we live stream all our games, and it was the first time that people um, around the world, because we recruit from around the world, uh, see wheelchair basketball, and they find young people, and especially parents, because that's what I was at one point, a parent of a young person, they find that there are opportunities out there uh, for their kids. So um, we do some educational coaching videos and athlete videos to try to help teach the sport, um, because it's relatively young, and to help let people know that there are opportunities for them to have access to um, healthy lives in college. Thank you. Um, again, sports at the State Department is a very big issue. Uh, as some of you may know a woman by the name of Ann Cody, who's a Paralympian who's now working at the State Department in what a program called Sports United. And the work that she's doing is integrating uh, athletes with disabilities into programs across the department. And why I mention both um, faith and sports is because these are two big areas that uh, countries are very involved in. And we know that um, for disabled individuals who may be really isolated in their communities, the ability to bring people who have various forms of disabilities into appropriate sports for them uh, not only is something which is empowering for the individual person, but it also begins to change the dialogue that's going on in communities. Because I think, you know, one of the biggest issues we still face here in the U.S. and around the world is we're not breaking bread together enough. We don't really do common things together enough. And so looking at ways that we can engage in activities that are typical activities in our communities is something that I really believe opens doors and opportunities. The next question I would like to pose is, uh, give me, give us an example of an obstacle that you've over, over, I'm sorry, that you've faced, and what have you done to um, try to address that obstacle? I'd like to go first. Um, so one obstacle that I've faced is um, dyslexia being a hidden disability. It's not um, obvious uh, from looking at someone. Um, it's, it can be hard to, um, for people to understand or um, to raise awareness about. So um, just somebody not knowing um, about how dyslexia affects somebody um, can be difficult. Um, but I guess to try to make it, um, actually, and um, that also leads to like people seeing only one way to do things. So um, reading with a book with your eyes um, is kind of the traditional way, and people like to stick to the tradition, so that has been a, an obstacle. Um, so I guess to overcome that is um, important to educate people, and especially teachers who are going to be um, in, in the classroom and have the opportunity to identify people with dyslexia at an early age. Um, so that's really important to help overcome the, the obstacle of people not understanding dyslexia. I definitely concur with uh, Brian's statements. Uh, in terms of mental illness, it's an invisible disability, and a lot of people think that there is a look. You know, when you say, I live with depression, they say, well, you don't look depressed, or it, it, it's not a certain appearance, I think. And so uh, trying to remove the stigma when it comes to that, uh, so, so I definitely agree with that. An obstacle that you faced and what you've done about it. I think that... Um, the stigma of disability is one thing that prevents a lot of acceptance at the college level. And so I keep talking about education, but I think that uh, educating people on our campuses will help us with really one of the main obstacles in growing new opportunities is funding. And so educating others on why this is important and why we need to continue to grow these programs helps us when we go to our administrations across the country and say these are important programs that need to be um, considered for this population. 
and college campuses should not be discriminating against students who have disabilities, right? So it's something that unfortunately you feel like you're going begging for the funding which they need to put forward, th forward anyway. Um, yeah. Um. I would say, I wouldn't really call it an obstacle, but I think one of the biggest challenges that I've faced is um, trying to strike that balance when you are uh, using narratives and storytelling to really put forth an honest, uh, an honest portrayal of, of living with a disability and how it is for not just for the, the person living with it, but for the entire family, is um, you know, really balancing when you're in that role of a caregiver and, and not wanting to make the story about yourself, but it's really the story of the person who's living with the, with the disability. And it's a, it's a difficult balance and it's a difficult challenge to strike because when your loved one is the one who, again, not non-communicative, but non-verbal, you know, and, um, and is not advocate, you know, or we're working to get him to advocate for himself, but he's not in a position to do a lot of self-advocacy yet. And, uh, when we share the stories and we talk about things, I and and people come back and and they address me. I'm like, it's not about really me. It's really about him, and it's about the community itself. And what what are the best ways to create programs of inclusion and change that are the right programs? Because there have been inclusionary programs that he's my my child has gone through in school or in different situations that were not done the right way. And you know, inclusion to be done has to be done the right way. And what that right way is is not the answer that I have here today, but it's an you know it's an ongoing process and it's an evolution of things that we're learning as a community, um, and that's been the biggest challenge for me to be able to find that balance between being the advocate, being the supporter, being the mother, but not being the story, you know. But I think it's okay that you're part of the story as part a mother of, of a younger fine. child. Yeah, part of it is okay. But so it's this transition issue, yeah. I think. Um, you know, when you're a parent, you have a responsibility for dealing with your children. Um, and then I think what many of us believe, it's really important to be able to make these transitions so that as individuals are becoming older, like your son, exactly. that we, as Brian, I think very nicely said, try another way. Um, I mean, these are the challenges we face in the Muslim community as well, because it's it really comes from a perspective of what the supporters and the parents and the elders and what is everyone thinking but really what is it like for the person who's living with it and what are their needs what do, and how and how will things be effectively good for them yeah and I, I think you know these the family is affected by what goes on and the dynamics and the age issues and how you transition from the role of a mother father to a role of the individual with the disability I think those are all interesting areas you're still working on yeah Want to say well, it's also the next generation too, not just the ones that we're working with now, but making easier for that next generation to come through and have some of these things that uh, that we're starting to grow. And the evolution, I think, is a great word to use. Um, one of the obstacles that I came across in my work with the mentoring program, and I think it's an obstacle that some of the other disability advocates probably face as well is that um, the goal of this mentoring program was to empower young women to become successful adults. And that word empowerment can be very confusing. And, and there is not really a set definition, I, I don't think. And um, it gets thrown around a lot, especially in the disability community. And so my obstacle was to present to the young women as many examples of empowerment as possible. Um, because in my work, I, I definitely consider myself a mentee in the program. Like I'm, I'm been learning as much from the mentors, um, you know, as the mentees themselves. And so I approached the this issue by really just trying to present as many examples of successful older women, um, you know, disabled women who are attorneys, who are Paralympians, who are bloggers, who are advocates were moms, um, you know, just letting them know that there's no one set answer. And again, the point that Brian had raised initially, um, approaching the issue from as many possible ways. Great, and the last question is, um, as we think about the future of the disability rights movement, 
what strategies should we be considering employing in the area of advocacy? Who'd like to go first? Brian? Oh. Um, I think it, it's important to take advantage of the fact that there's power in numbers and uniting, uh, uniting people with disabilities together to make their voice louder and make their voice heard um, in places that matter with, with policy makers and people who are responsible for enforcing the laws. Um, so that's the strategy that I would say. Thank you. So I think that there needs to be uh, more discussion of mental illness when it comes to disabilities. Um, Despite the broadening of the definition of disability in the ADA, I think that people don't necessarily associate mental illness as a disability, considering that it's, it's an invisible one. And so I think that we need to associate that because the cultural norms, we don't view that as a disability. And I think that people need to realize that because I don't think people know that their rights, that they do have rights and that they necessarily have rights within the ADA. I also think that uh, cultural competency is extremely important as well. Um, so th there are so many things that we could definitely work on. Could you talk a little bit more about cultural competencies and what you think we should be doing? Sure, absolutely. Uh, in terms of com cultural competency in my personal experience, I uh, went through multiple therapists and I think that my best experiences were with therapists who were Latina specifically for me. I felt that I could be more myself. I felt that I could use certain language that maybe other therapists wouldn't understand. And so that was a very positive experience for me. Even in just, just beyond mental health care, health care in general, I think that with cultural competency and emphasizing that in training for mental health professionals, I think that the care can, can be improved because then people will not be as uh, distrusting of the of doctors and of other professionals because they feel that their beliefs and their faith and all these other things that they that are so ingrained in in who they are will be respected and viewed as important. Thank you. I think moving forward, continued exposure is so important in in all areas. Uh, exposure of the programs that are out there, the possibilities of. Um, maximizing the abilities of people with disabilities. Uh, one of the funnest things that happened in our program last year was one of our girls was chosen for the Play Like a Girl campaign. And it's so powerful to see the commercial and she comes around the corner in her wheelchair with her jersey on and she says, I play college basketball. And how many people never would have thought of that opportunity out there? So I think growing exposure um, is part of that evolution of growing opportunities and acceptance. This is a question of ignorance. Do we have any professional wheelchair basketball teams? Europe is the no, hot better professional wheelchair basketball. Yeah. In the US, do um, we have In the any? US, um, probably not yet. Yeah, they have some great teams. I met a woman in Finland who studied in the United States and played professional wheelchair basketball in Germany and got paid to do it. You know, I, at the event that I was at yesterday, the interfaith event, you know, it was interesting in, in the research that we, I did on the ADA to find out how faith communities and houses of worship were exempt from ADA. And not uh, in every state. I've also state. found out that California uh -huh. has a law which doesn't exempt. We need to California. Yeah. <laughs> we'll change the law here. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, uh, in regards to, you know, our faith communities probably, the some of the most uh, looking forward effective strategies is to continue to be as public and as vocal as possible and to encourage um, encourage the youth, you know, those who are living with special needs and disabilities to take charge of their own lives and to take charge of their own voices as much as they can in whatever ways that they can and to be able to be vocal about what their needs are and what changes they need to see happen that will help make their lives be a more better, accessible, inclusive, uh, independent, and uh, you know, fulfilling life. Um, the more I think you know, self-advocacy can grow, the better it is. And the more you know, us as caregivers and supporters and family members and loved ones can help facilitate that happening, then that's the only, you know, they can, there can only be positive change coming out of that. Thank you. Cindy. Um, I agree with Doug that the importance of exposure is so critical moving forward. Um, 
and especially as we are mentoring and teaching this younger generation um, and the importance of carrying on the fight for disability rights. Um, I think that, you know, also moving forward um, to expand the conversation around disabilities um, rights and not just to focus on those concrete concepts that are so measurable in terms of like housing and education and employment. And not to say that those are not totally important to our lives and our success, but also to talk about things that are not as measurable um, and are not, that we can't really put our finger on and say, okay, we're going to convene this task force to measure the data on, on um, you know, how many uh, disabled women are getting um, accessible um, preventative health services and, and how many of those conversations are happening around our public schools and sort of those conversations are also um, really important as well moving forward and um, yeah. Thank you. So for me uh, there are a couple of messages that have come out. Um, try another way which is something that we should all be not only speaking about but I think putting forth different ways of addressing issues. Certainly in the field of education, uh, ensuring that a teacher isn't looking to teach all children the same way is critical. Whether there are any disabled children in the class or not doesn't matter. All children do not learn the same way. I very much agree also on issues of uh, power in numbers and power in uh, cross-disability. And the points that came up here frequently uh, addressing the issue of hidden disabilities and visible disabilities. This is a very critical issue, I completely agree. Uh, most people in the United States and around the world do not realize that most people's disabilities are not visible disabilities, and the ability to help people who have invisible disabilities to feel empowered to speak out um, for themselves and to look at obtaining their rights, I think, is also what ADA is really all about. And um, it's, we're looking, I think, now at a very interesting set of dynamics. Working locally, I think, is very important. Know who your neighbor is, being able to work in a community. But social media is also something which is really gives us tremendous opportunities. I'd like to thank all of you for your great insight and for being chosen as champions of change, and look forward to working with you. Thanks.